Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the annual South Asia Institute lecture. My name is Subir Sinha, and I'm the director for the SWAS South Asia Institute. Uh, news from India over the last one decade, but even before that, on matters of democracy, dissent, spaces for civil society, uh, rights of women, have not, this news has not really been that good. And in fact, over that period of time, uh, many activists have taken great risks to fight on behalf of civil society, democracy, dissent, and the rights of women. So in that context, it is really a great honor for us here at SOAS to be able to welcome today's speaker, uh, Indira Jaising, a senior advocate at uh, in India's uh, Supreme Court. And let me just pull up her bio on uh, my email to myself. Um, note to self, okay. So I think many people here are familiar with uh, Indira Jai Singh's name, fame, and the work that she has done over the years. Um, Indira uh, was an additional solicitor general of uh, India from 2009 to 14. And currently she practices in the Supreme Court as a senior advocate. Uh, she was educated at the University of Bangalore and the University of Mumbai. And she's been a pioneer, uh, pioneering legal activist and lawyer in India. She was the first woman to be designated a senior advocate in the Bombay High Court and the first woman to be appointed Attorney General, a position that she held from 2009 to 14. She's a founder member of the Lawyers Collective, uh, an organization that works on the unmet needs of marginalized communities. She, along with Anand Grover, who we had the pleasure to listen to on Monday, uh, are also the co-founders of the Leaflet.in, an independent web portal for legal news and opinions. Those who follow the crackdown on civil society in India in the past decade will remember that the collective has borne the brunt of many of the actions of the government of India. Ms. Jaising is well known for having argued many landmark cases against various aspects of discrimination against women. Uh, you know, she's also led on many cases on domestic violence against women and women's economic rights. India is also a prominent, preeminent human rights and gender uh, equality advocate. Uh, and she's a lawyer with further expertise in environmental issues, including advocating for the victims of the Bhopal gas tragedy, and more recently for uh, the Priya Pillai of Greenpeace India. She was an expert member of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women from 2010 to 12. Indira has been a fellow at uh, the London-based Institute for Advanced Legal Studies and a visiting scholar at Columbia University's Law School. She was awarded the Padma Shri, one of India's highest civilian honors in 2005. And I think, I believe in 2018, she was named by Fortune magazine as, uh, as part of the list of 50 global leaders. So it's a real privilege and a pleasure to have Indira here. Uh, just in terms of certain housekeeping rules, uh, I just want to say that there'll be a brief Q&A after she finishes speaking. Please keep your questions focused on what she has said and uh, do not spend more than 30 seconds articulating what you have to uh, ask her. Uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, you know, before she comes on to speak, I really want to uh, thank uh, Sunil Poon, who is the administrator for the South Asia Institute. Please wave to us, uh, whose role in the organization of the event uh, is absolutely key. And to Suresh Grover from the monitoring group, uh, please wave to the audience, Suresh. Uh, yes, uh, who, who, who had, uh, also had a, uh, sort of a key role in organizing this event. Thanks, and uh, may I please now invite India? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. May I start? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, before I present my lecture, I'd like to tell you that it's basically going to be divided into three different parts. One is India at its founding moment. These, then I go on to the two erosions that I'm aware of and I was part of. One was during the emergency in 1975, and the second is the period 2014 to the current period, that is 2024. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's a bit too premature for me to attend the post-24 election period. 
uh, things are not very clear as yet, but uh, but uh, but certain directions appear to be clear. The very fact that the election results went the way they did is a victory, but let me begin at the beginning. But broadly, this is an introduction. This is the three uh, different issues that I'll be addressing. India at its founding moment to begin with. So uh, there's a lot of talk in India. We, we refer to it as the idea of India. So uh, the vision of India by its founding fathers permeates throughout the constitution of India. And I will, of course, be talking about constitutional changes. Uh, serving as a guiding light for its interpretation. In other words, India's constitution is interpreted in the light of the principles created, contained in its preamble. And that is what we call the vision of India, the vision of the preamble of India. It reflects the quest for social justice as much as it reflects the values of the freedom movement. Central to the vision of the preamble are part three, which deal with the fundamental rights of citizens. By rights provided under part three, the constitution guarantees to all citizens liberty, equality, dignity, freedom of religion under article 25 and 26, and they provide for which provide for liberty of belief, faith, and worship, and the right to freedom of religion, all guaranteed under Part Three. The Constitution of India was adopted, as we all know, in 1949 by the people for the people by themselves. But uh, it was in a socio-political scenario which was rife with mirrored inequalities and exclusions. Hence, the constitution became a document for restructuring the idea of India, distinct from its colonial past and its traditional inequalities, limiting exclusion, encouraging inclusion, and reinforcing liberty, equality, and fraternity became the founding principles of the constitution of India. I am going to now quote from a passage of a judgment of uh, our current Chief Justice, Justice D. Y. Chandrachul, in a case which is known as the Indian Young Lawyers Association. Now, this was a case which dealt with the exclusion of women from worship in a particular temple known as Shabri Malai. And this was challenged on the ground that it discriminates against women. Uh, so, so I thought it was an open and shut case, and I was appearing in this matter. And I thought, how can you exclude women from worship? You can't, because fundamental right to, uh, to belief is guaranteed. But the objection to women entering the Shabri Malai te temple was absolutely virulent. And uh, it was very difficult for the judges to give a judgment. The majority gave a judgment saying, yes, women have a right to enter the temple. And what I'm going to read to you is a quotation from Justice D. Y. Chandrachut's judgment, uh, upholding the right of women to enter the temple, because he describes in this passage what the Indian constitution is all about in one paragraph. And this is what he says. He says, quote, reading Dr. Ambedkar compels us to look at the other side of independence movement. Besides the struggle for independence from British rule, there was another struggle going on since centuries and which still continues. The struggle has been for social emancipation. It has been a struggle for the replacement of an unjust social order. It has been the fight for undoing historical injustice and for righting fundamental wrongs with fundamental rights. The Constitution of India is the end product of two struggles. Now, this is a fact which is often forgotten, which he put on record that it was not just an anti-imperialist movement, not just an anti-colonial movement, but also a movement for social reform, where uh, the key to all this reform was equality and dignity. And the Constitution represents the aspirations of those who were denied basic ingredients of a dignified life. So these are the two founding faiths of the Constitution, the need for social reform. And this issue arose in that case because uh, the our opponents were relying on tradition, custom. And uh, they were arguing that religion is a ruling norm 
to decide whether to enter a temple or not to enter a temple. You have to take a decision from the internal logic of that religion and not look at the constitution. Whereas we were arguing that you have to look at the constitution and not the internal norms of the religion. And we succeeded, four of the judges decided that women could enter the temple, whereas one of them dissented. By the way, the judgment has not been allowed to be implemented. Uh, there was a young woman, her name is Bindu. She was scheduled caste, and she's the only woman, along with a colleague of hers, who succeeded in climbing the hill on which the temple is located. After that, she was beaten and thrown out. And no one has been allowed to climb that temple since then, and the case has gone for a review. Now, the social and political context of the Indian constitution was adopted characterizes its nature and objectives. It was framed at the time of great communal violence that we all know at the stage of partition. Large-scale violence being perpetrated on the lines of religious nationalism, for want of a better word, mm. as a consequence of the partition of India. Yet the constitution makers did not succumb to the communal forces and chose to keep the constitution secular. Now, in the last decade, however, we have seen this shunning of these secular ideals espoused in the constitution by the Union of India, headed by our prime minister, who continues to be the prime minister today. Uh, he has not yet faced a vote of confidence on the floor of the house, but he has been sworn in as the prime minister, uh, who who says that he has come in by a historic uh, for a historic third term, equating himself with Pandit Nehru, who uh, was the only prime minister who came in for three terms. But as Shashi Tharoor pointed out in a recent television uh, interview, uh, Pandit Nehru had come in with an absolute majority for the third term, whereas this gentleman has come in, uh, he has not succeeded in getting an absolute majority to be able to form the government on his own. And the government is what we in India call a coalition government. So Shashi Tharoor was excellent in making this distinction. I don't know why, but he const our prime minister constantly feels the need to outshine Pandit Nehru or to compare himself with Pandit Nehru or to put Pandit Nehru down. What if, which of the three it is, I don't know, and I can't say. As, as uh, so, so, and of course, in my opinion, he has stripped the Indian constitution of its democratic norms and values. He's broken down constitutional safeguards, uh, which separate the three branches of government as a means of accountability. Now, as a lawyer, I have been wondering how this has been achieved uh, without amending the constitution. And this is the heart of my, my lecture. Uh, what I'm saying is that all this has been achieved without amending the Constitution of India. So how does it come about? That's the question that we all have to ask ourselves. And I have, of course, reached the conclusion that he has succeeded in doing this by quite simply ignoring. It's like the Constitution. You ignore the Constitution. That's it. Just ignore it. It's there. And, uh, but you don't, have to, you don't have to abide by it. So why bother to amend it? There's no need to amend the constitution. And uh, all of you, some of you, might have seen after his uh, victory in, the, in 2024, rather after, the, after forming the government, the first thing he did is picked up the text of the constitution and put his head on it. So that's it. You can do that. It's all about optics. You can, you know, uh, pay your respects to the Constitution of India, but you can ignore it as well if you happen to be the Prime Minister of India. I can't ignore it. The minute I ignore it, I'll have a criminal case against me. The, the only two significant amendments were the abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution of India. Now, this is amazing. It was achieved by a sleight of hand. Uh, how was it achieved? It was simply achieved by changing the word state government to governor during a presidential order, during a time when the state was under presidential president's rule. So you, when you say you need the concurrence of the state government, just amend the word state government and say you need the concurrence of the governor. And as a consequence, the Union of India gave consent to itself 
to abrogate the, const uh, the uh, Article 370. Supreme Court of India surprisingly upheld it, but that, that's what it's all about. So, uh, so there was no need to amend the Constitution. Otherwise, it would have required a constitutional amendment. The other amendment of significance was a reservation for upper castes in public employment, something which has not been done in the last 75 years. Reservations in public employment is meant for uh, Dalits, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and OBC. So for the first time in Indian constitutional history, the constitution was amended and reservations were made available to upper castes. And obviously many people have said this is just part of the general uh, Brahminism that is being encouraged in India. But again, the Supreme Court upheld that amendment. So these, barring these two amendments, there have been no other amendments to the constitution of India. Of course, we had the Citizenship Amendment Act, but that was a statute. It was not an amendment to the Constitution. It was a statute under which, and there were minor amendments to the Foreigners Act, amendments to the Passports Act, but major amendments to the Citizenship Act, which said that people from certain countries, Hindus, could migrate into India and be given fast-track citizenship. This did not include Muslims. So if you can see, it's all consistent with the rejection of secularism. India is a secular country. So as I said, what we saw is the constitution simply being ignored as we advanced. And ultimately, in my opinion, we have seen the constitution being repudiated. And I will mention why. Uh, there has been the silent repudiation of the Constitution of India without changing the written, written letter of the Constitution. Uh, the, there have been significant movements, of course, in the country, the Shaheen Baj, Bagh movement, which you probably all know about, and later we'll talk about the persecution that it led to, and, of course, the farm laws. And it was the movement of the farm laws that compelled uh, the prime minister to withdraw the three laws which would have privatized agricultural land and privatized markets. So when it comes to human rights of citizens, uh, we, I will be speaking about that a little later. During the last 10 years, we have not been able to uh, handle the issue of victimization of uh, civil society activists. So while certain opposition members who have been arrested have been able to be vocal about their um, arrest and uh, about their um, intimidation and coercion, members of civil society haven't seen similar support from the country as a whole. Uh, they just didn't seem to have the political uh, support that is required to make it into a national issue. And so many members of civil society continue to remain behind bars till today, as I speak, under what is known as the Unlawful Activities Act. Now I will just move on to what I said were the two phases that where the constitution was eroded. One was the emergency and the other is 14 to 24. Now there are some people who call the phase uh, 20, 14 to 24 as an undeclared emergency. I do not agree with this description. I do not agree with this analysis. Now, for, so let's talk first about the emergency. The emergency certainly suspended civil and political rights in the country. There was no doubt about that. The right to assemble and protest are actually the proud legacy of the independence movement, uh, which elevated nonviolent struggle and civil disobedience to a new level for millions of Indians. So in June 1975, of course, this legacy was brought to a very brutal end by Mrs. Gandhi. The emergency on account of internal disturbance under Article 352 was declared. Uh, we did witness uh, erosion of the idea of India from one anchored in principles of liberty, democracy, emanating from universal principles 
of, of, of human rights. It is true, of course, that the emergency was, I would say, unnecessary because uh, the protests could have been dealt with under law and order uh, laws. But Mrs. Gandhi thought it fit to declare an emergency in order to suspend the human rights of citizens to protest, to organize, to speak. And as we all know, uh, this matter was taken to the court. And in the ADM Jabalpur judgment, uh, the Supreme Court upheld uh, the suspension of fundamental rights. And it was Vibhi Chandrachut who said, and I quote, I have a diamond bride, diamond heart hope that the state will treat its citizens as its own children, close quote. So this attitude of judges of treating the state as a benevolent mother towards the citizens uh, was exhibited in this judgment. And the question is whether this will continue to hold true for today. Will our judiciary still consider uh, the uh, government of benevolent state, which knows best what to do and any challenge will be dealt with as a terrorist act, which it has been in the last 10 years. However, I wish to make a point over here. And the point that I wish to make is the emergency was given to us by way of a written document. It was an order issued under the constitution. It was not an order outside the framework of the Constitution. The Indian Constitution provides for the declaration of an emergency uh, in, in, where there is a quote-unquote internal disturbance. This is the contrast with which what is going on today. The, the contrast is everything that is being done is being done outside the framework of the Constitution, whereas during the emergency, what was done was within the framework of the Constitution, an internal emergency was declared. Uh, I, I'd like to quote uh, a very well-known historian, the late Bipin Chandra, who said that both Jay Prakash Narayan and Mrs. Gandhi did what they did in defense of democracy, each called the other a dictator, each called the other a tyrant, each called the other a fascist, but neither of them uh, re uh, renounced a liberal democracy. And here is the quote. It's in a book called In the Name of Democracy. He says, the defense of Indian democracy seems to have been the main justification for both Jay Prakash Narayan and the emergency regime. In other words, there was no complete rejection of the idea of India or the idea of liberal democracy. This is where you will find the contrast with the present regime. In my opinion, the, the regime which has come into existence from 2014 to 2024 rejects the idea of India being a liberal democracy. They don't believe that India is or should be a liberal democracy. So the emergency represented an attempt at eroding the spirit and ethos of the constitution. What we witnessed in the last decade was actually a repudiation of the constitution. This is why I call it a repudiation of the constitution. Uh, as I said, many authors call it an undeclared emergency, but that's just half the truth. It is not an undeclared emergency. It's a repudiation of the constitution. And, and that too, uh, that's why I said there's no need to amend the constitution. You simply keep it aside. That's all you need to do. Now, of course, we know that the stated aim of the RSS, the ideological progenitor of the ruling Bharatiya Janata Party, is to remold India into a Hindu state and to rewrite history to suggest that Vedic India was always liberal and that there is a continuity between ancient India and constitutional India. This is a falsehood. And... Uh, I believe that uh, the Indian constitution represents a break from the past. There is no continuity. There was no concept of liberal democracy in uh, Vedic India. It comes in for the first time in 1947, 1948, also with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's not something that India invented. It was a borrowing from the entire human rights that was developing worldwide. So to claim this kind of continuity is a falsehood. 
So as I said, there is no belief in liberal democracy in the ruling party. Uh, efforts have been made to transform the state to one governed by the constitution, to one governed by an uh, uh, ideology of Hindu or min, militant Hindu nationalism. S there are some people who describe it as caste nationalism. Caste nationalism because you're bringing in the upper castes now into the into the into all organs of power. All this is being done in the name of reform and anti-colonialism. As we know, uh, Christopher Jafflot notes in his book, Modi, Hindu nationalism is rooted in a vast area of alleged apolitical movements whose sole mission is to reform society. And I'd like to make a point over here. The RSS has been banned in India on three different occasions. I need not go into the occasions, but the ban was ultimately lifted because they claimed to be a cultural organization and apolitical and not involved in politics. But today, in Modi's first term, 41 of the 66 BJP ministers did come from the RSS. And after the election of 2019, 38 out of 53 BJP ministers in the Modi uh, in the Modi government had a Sangh Parivar background. So during the Janta Dal regime, there was a provision in the constitution of the BJP and in the constitution of the uh, RSS that you cannot be a member of two organizations, the RSS and the BJP. That rule no longer holds. Today, you can be a member of the BJP and be a, a member of the RSS and become a minister. In the, so that dual membership rule was abolished. And the abolition of that dual membership rule has led to a situation where you now have people who can proudly say that we are members of the RSS and be ministers in India's, uh, in India's government. So, uh, as I said, all this is done uh, by saying RSS is a cultural organization, not a political organization. Every organ of state now has a substantial presence of the RSS, uh, going about implementing the agenda of the RSS. The last that I noticed was in the armed forces, where the head of the armed forces said that now I am going to start looking at warfare, uh, it, how it occurred in the Mahabharata to understand what warfare is all about. So we always thought that the army is the is the is the one surviving secular inst institution in India, and we now have a lot of articles written. I'm not an expert on the subject, but I've read a bit about it, where uh, the army also is being infiltrated by a substantial presence of the RSS. Universities, of course, without saying all of you know what happened in JNU and Jamia. Uh, in the Jamia case, of course, I was in, uh, involved for the students. Parliament undoubtedly has been uh, undermined by passing laws through ordinances. It happened with the farm laws. They were passed as ordinances. And uh, Many other laws have been amended through the ordinance route. Uh, in particular, we need to mention also the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which has been amended through a money bill uh, to prevent scrutiny by the Rajya Sabha, the upper house. And it's the first time ever that I have seen the creation of an offense, a crime under a money bill, which is meant only to deal with issues of taxation and uh, drawing money from the Consolidated Fund of India. The issues are under challenge, but uh, somebody was asking me the question about the courts. Well, the courts have put it in cold storage, and uh, meaning thereby that those who are uh, sitting in prison under the PMLA are sitting in prison under the, uh, under the PMLA, while the courts decide whether this money bill could have been passed or not passed. So that is the extent to which parliament has been undermined. Now, about the judiciary, we know that the judiciary struck down the National Judicial Appointments Bill uh, because the bill contained the dominant voice of the government of India in the matter of making appointments. It was struck down. Now, we at least some of us expected there'll be a new law 
uh, which will remove the dominant voice of the government and reenact this law for judicial appointments. That did not happen. Uh, we stayed with the what is known as the collegium system, where the five senior most judges of the Supreme Court decide who should be a judge of the Supreme Court. So it is a self-appointed judiciary. So what we have seen is a kind of a quid pro quo between the government and the um, uh, and the judiciary, where uh, there is a consensus on who should get appointed as a judge of the High Court and Supreme Court. And one of the most uh, unacceptable examples was that of the appointment of a lady called Victoria Gowry, who uh, was uh, the head of the women's wing of the BJP. But that wasn't the end of the story. She had in a video said, uh, in India, we have white terror and green terror. And these videos were circulated, and we went to court saying she should not be appointed. And as we were, Mr. Grover was arguing the case, as we were arguing the case, she was being sworn in as a judge of the High Court. Simultaneously, the two processes went on. And of course, the petition got rejected. So you can see how uh, the, the judiciary in the matter of appointments was hand in glove with the government. I don't think any appointment to the Supreme Court takes place without the full concurrence of the government of India. Yeah, one of the things that really shocked me was uh, yeah, when uh, Sai Baba's case, you know, he's a disabled um, professor uh, who's been in, in prison under Unlawful Activities Act. And when he was acquitted, the matter came before a particular judge called M.R. Shah. And he, he, we, we said, but... Where are the allegations of violence? There are no allegations of violence against him. And he said, you know, uh, violence doesn't, you don't have to pick up a gun to be violent. You can be violent in your mind, and that's enough to constitute a terrorist act. And he actually set aside that acquittal and remanded the matter back to the, uh, to the Supreme. And by the way, he was the same judge who, when he was in Manipur, he said, Modi is my hero. And he got appointed to the Supreme Court of India. So that's the extent to which I think that the independence of the judiciary has been uh, uh, eroded. Um, if ever you have the Chief Justice coming here, please do ask him these questions. I'm not the right person to whom, to whom you should ask these questions. I understand that he was interested in coming here, and I don't know what happened. He didn't come. Uh, maybe he saw your flyer that Ms. Jai Singh is speaking here or something like that. It's quite possible. Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is entirely possible. So uh, that was about judges like Amar Shah who continue to sit. We've had civil society activists withdrawing their petitions rather than getting them heard by the Supreme Court of India because they get listed before judges who know talk like this the other one being Bela Trivedi. So every time a matter is fixed in her court, civil society, Umar Khalid withdrew his petition rather than having it heard. And uh, so this uh, sentiment of fostering majoritarianism definitely crept into the judiciary. The final evidence of which is the judgment in the Ram Mandir case and the fact that the Supreme Court directed to set the formation of a trust uh, which will run the Ram Mandir. So remember one thing, the trust which runs the Ram Mandir has been set up under a judgment of the Supreme Court of India. Now you see what happens is you have on the 26th, the 22nd of January, 2024, our prime minister went and uh, inaugurated the temple, consecrated it, consecrated it. He assumed the role of a priest and he consecrated the temple. And uh, we, civil libertarians, were not the only one who protested against it. There were very learned religious leaders who came out on record and said, this is not your job. You can't do this. But he did it. He persisted. And as far as I can see, this is the ultimate repudiation of the secular constitution of India. There's, there can be nothing 
uh, beyond this. There really can be nothing beyond this. And the I can't think of anything else which would uh, make a complete demolition between state and uh, secular, the, the sacred and the secular. There's nothing there beyond that. And uh, surprisingly, he did it during the election campaign as well. Uh, two distinct uh, issues come to mind. One is what they call the Pran Pratishta, the Pran Pratishta, and the uh, when the sunlight comes and hits the forehead of Lord Ram. So they had set up several mirrors, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that the sunlight came and hit the forehead. And all this was happening during the election campaign. And uh, during the election campaign, he said, Ram is my idea of India. Now, you've come full circle. The, the, I, I really can't think of anything else uh, that would explain what is uh, changing in India. And uh, he said it and he, he just got away with it. And of course, uh, the, the fact that um, two days before the uh, people went to the polls in his own constituency, he went off on meditation. So why am I bringing these things up? Not because, what is the constitutional implication of these things? These are issues that would disqualify a person from the election. Because in India, there is a law, the Representation of People's Act, which says that you cannot uh, campaign for getting elected in the name of religion. It's there. It's there in the Representation of People's Act. And several people made complaints to the, to the election commission, the election Commission did nothing. Now, apart from this, of course, there's a very, the strategies that are used are several. In my opinion, the most important strategy is persecution of those who dissent and impunity for those who are your own. So two examples of impunity, of course, you had Anurag Thakur, who used words like Golimaro, uh, kill them. And no criminal complaint was filed against him. On the contrary, he was elevated to the level of a minister in the government. Now, apparently, he is no longer a minister in this government, but rumors are that he's going to be head of the BJP. So, again, perhaps a promotion, because the president of the BJP has become a minister, so they need uh, a new president for the BJP, it's probably going to be Anurag Thakur. And the second was a couple, Mishra, who said very similar things and against whom also no, no, uh, no criminal action was taken. So on the one hand, this is impunity for those who are your own. And on the other hand, for people who dissent in any sense of the word, you have the Unlawful uh, Activities Prevention Act, the Act of Terrorism. And all of you know, for example, even in the Bhima Koregao case, if anybody takes the trouble to read the charge sheet, there's no mention of anyone dying. Whereas the definition of terrorism says whoever causes death by use of bombs, not a single person is alleged to have died. And yet these people have been sitting in prison for the last six years. So... It's in one sentence to sum it up, it is this abuse of the criminal justice system where you have impunity for those who belong to your ideology and you have persecution for those who dare to, to dissent from what you say. As I said, the Bhima Korigaon case is the prime example. And of course, Omar Khaled is inside also for similar reasons. So uh, these are the various strategies that have been used. Uh, I won't say much about the press because I think just about everybody present in this room probably knows that uh, our press in India is what we call Godi media, meaning thereby sitting in the lap of the ruling party. So we don't have an independent press. Yes, there are people in social media who have managed to be very independent and uh, YouTubers and uh, Part of the election victory is attributed to the success of these people in social media who have been on YouTube all over the world uh, where they have not been. The, that's one constituency uh, the ruling party has not been able to silence. 
though there are many FIRs against people for what they've written on the net, but they've not been able to silence the YouTubers. And they have substantially contributed to... Now, I, I'm therefore going to end by saying exactly what is going on uh, over here. One, uh, you notice in the emergency, the Constitution was suspended. They, uh, the fundamental rights were suspended. Here, what's happening is being ignored and being repudiated. So that's a very vital difference. And how does this happen? It happens through the rhetoric of uh, anti-colonialism. So what I think the state has succeeded in doing is they've set up a norm above the Constitution of India. And this norm above the Constitution of India is, is either religious nationalism or it's cultural nationalism or it's a, a, a claimed ancient past which goes back a thousand years which is superior to the Constitution of India. So what they're asking us to do is to owe allegiance to a norm which is above the Constitution of India. And this, this is an issue that we have not been able to fight uh, because even the judges are succumbing to some of this thing. You'll find them quoting the Vedas and the Arthashastra in their judgments. And, and then, of course, the uh, just the same example, the installation of the Songol in the new parliament was also very shocking because the Songol is a symbol of kingship. So, obviously, I asked myself the question that uh, when you are inaugurating a parliament, which is the uh, which is the place where republicanism is exhibit showing itself, how can you install a symbol of kingship? It again tells you that they are repudiating republicanism itself. And uh, that finally, uh, as I said, I cannot speak too much about uh, what the future holds. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, the plan of uh, de facto, I have told you what they've done, but they wanted to do this de jure as well. And this is the reason why they said we want uh, 400 elected members, because then they can amend the Constitution. So I will end by saying that they have not succeeded in their plan of amending the Constitution of India, which was, for me and in my mind, the biggest apprehension that what if they uh, amend the constitution de jure and make it a Hindu state, then the battle is obviously lost for a long time to come. But they have not. This is, for me, the one most singular success of the election of 2024. And uh, so just a few closing thoughts about what is the task ahead. If at all is possible, this incoming government, which is a coalition government, and we know now that uh, our prime minister is dependent on his allies. So we, we would like to see the undoing of the damage that has been done in the last 10 years. Bail for people who are from civil society who are facing uh, allegations of terrorism. They've introduced three new criminal laws and in the name of decolonizing India, our prime minister says that in, in, two, in 1984, we did not decolonize India. We began the process of decolonization in 2014 when he became the prime minister. And, and this is the reason why uh, the three new laws have been given Sanskrit titles. And as far as he's concerned, this is decolonization. You just change the name. If you see the content of the laws, it's the repackaging of English common law. <laughs> and a rewording of some of the sections in the law, a reintroduction of sedition in the act, in, in the Indian Penal Code, a reintroduction of uh, Unlawful Activities Act from the special statute into the general Indian Penal Code, Lord Macaulay's Indian Penal Code, which according to practicing criminal lawyers has stood the time, uh, stood, the, stood the test of two centuries. 
and uh, which which I will have I will say is very precisely worded. They have not removed uh, marital rape exemption from the new law. It continues to be there. So uh, it's 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 going to be, and I have gone on record to say that it's going to be a huge disaster. It's coming into force on the first of. July. And as we all know, yes, under the Indian constitution, you can't have uh, retrospective substantive laws, but you can apply your procedural laws retrospectively or to pending litigation. It can be done. And, and the new criminal procedure code virtually ushers in a police state. Many people have said it. It allows handcuffing. Uh, it allows uh, remand into police custody over a period of 15 days, but it can extend up to 90 days. And uh, it uh, allows attachment of property uh, by the police. It confers all these powers on very junior police officers with no need for sanction from any higher authority to uh, commence prosecution. Unlawful Activities Act now can be commenced by an ordinary policeman in any jurisdiction. So many have argued that they bring in. So one of the biggest items on the agenda of the new government ought to be uh, when Parliament meets on the 26th of June uh, to demand the deferment of the implementation of these three new criminal laws because there will be chaos. After 1st June, we will have two parallel criminal justice systems in operation. One for crimes registered prior to 1st July and the other for crimes registered after 1st July uh, 2024. So this is what we have been campaigning for. Uh, with our politicians, and this is what we have been saying in the public domain. Thank you. Maybe we'll take more questions, and maybe we'll take them in clusters of three, and then feel free to address uh, all or any of them. Please. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask that RSS three major project is uh, two has been achieved like Article 370 and Ram Mandir. What do you think about the Uniform Civil Code? Would that uh, they will proceed further with this uh, mandate or they will take a back seat? Okay. Yes, please. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. Given the institutional... You have to speak up. Yeah, just speak up a little bit because we don't have a roving mic today. Yeah. Mm. Given the institutional crisis in uh, what would you say to lawyers invested, uh, practicing lawyers who are invested in defending civil liberties or pushing social reform through courts? Because there was a sense of optimism in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Uh, but there is a kind of especially progressive lawyers are kind of slipping into cynicism. So, what would you say to that? Or what message would you give to that person? Okay, so shall I take this? Yeah, yeah. So the first answer to your first question is what you said is absolutely correct. And it started with the uh, the CAA and the NRC. That's when it started because it was in Shaheen Bagh uh, where the question of citizenship was raised. Who is a citizen? And that question could not be answered without reference to the Constitution of India. So... It was there that the women of Shaheen Bagh took a copy of the constitution in their hands and they protested with the constitution because they said, look, nowhere in the constitution has it been said that citizenship is based on religion. So the popularity or the acceptability of the constitution among the general public grew from there. Mm. Also because uh, the the question of creating a national register of citizens arose for the first time when the CAA Act was passed. So the whole country was dis discussing what is the meaning of us being a citizen, who is a citizen, and for that they had to turn to the Constitution. And of course, finally, during the campaign, it was Rahul Gandhi who picked up that red book and kept showing it to the people. But it is true that uh, that is why I ended my speech by saying, what is the most significant takeaway from this uh, election? It is the fact that de, de jure, they cannot amend the constitution. So I would say the real hero of this election is the constitution of India, which accounts for this downloading. Mm -hmm. And it accounts for the fact that the red book has become so popular. The, on the question of the UCC, one of the allies has already said that we will not allow 
the uh, UCC to go through. So I do not think that they will proceed with it. They will put it on the back burner. It doesn't mean they'll give it up. On the question of uh, cynicism among lawyers, I don't think there is any cynicism amongst lawyers, no. Pr practicing lawyers have not become cynical. Uh, they, I've, I had said it in the last uh, five years that the battles of the future will take place in court, and they are taking place in court. And there have been magnificent defenses by uh, by the legal profession of the attempt to erode civil liberties. Anand is here. He recently got bail for Shoma Sen in the uh, Bhima Koregaon case. Two or three other um, um, accused persons have got bail. So there is no cynicism to deal with in the legal profession at all. It, it's even now, after the election results, lawyers have been speaking up and writing articles everywhere about why they oppose this government. Let's take uh, Rochna, and uh, there's you, and there's Shailesh. So, yeah, and then we'll come back to the two of you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm a huge fan of everything that you do, and thank you also for organizing this event. It's it's really an honor uh, and a privilege to, to have you and to hear you. So a couple of questions. One, and I'm a former Jane White, so I speak uh, as one who's uh, yeah, exercised all sorts of things about COVID and the lack of bail uh, um, um, that, that, that has been there. What we've seen is, you've, so going from the cynicism question, we've seen, and you yourself said, that courts are uh, selective in, and have to be selective in the battles they pick. At least the judgments have been like that from Ayodhya to, to elsewhere. And in a sense, we need civil society movements that would support uh, 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 the, for, for the courts to then be able to, you know, as it were, justify these in, in, in some democratic uh, way. Um, so um, so that would be my sort of first submission that, that uh, the cynicism is to the extent that judges are having to pick their battles, everyone is, and that there needs to be, as it were, some alliance uh, here with civil society movements and the courts to take the constitution in offense, uh, to go back to Suri's question to uh, the people and, and, and for it to become a mass, uh, if you like, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, a mass rallying point and not just for elites. But to go back to the constitution itself, although this is not my view, a lot of people have said that the constitution does, of course, set up a very strong executive. And in many cases, courts have wound. It's saying that we can't say this because the court they, it does set up. And that was a Nehru Ambedkar uh, convergence uh, during constitution making to create a strong central government that would be empowered to, uh, to uh, you know, if you like, initiate social reform, uh, uh, sub, you know, deal with the social inequalities. Mm -hmm. And the assumption was that that authority would be benevolent, that there would be, you know, well, so so the constitutionality, even of the kind of strong executive that we have, uh, is something that, um, that yeah, is, is, was something that the founding fathers somehow, you know, were also um, uh, for good reason. Uh, uh, complicit in. So the way in which, so the constitution, yes, is secular in its ideals, but the structure of power that it sets up is highly centralized and it is uh, highly, you know, uh, if you like, towards a strong executive. Are there changes that you and other activists would like to see in the constitutional design itself that would then prevent uh, uh, the rise uh, of the kind of uh, strong centralized executive that we've seen? Sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. Thanks. Uh... Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very insightful. Um, I would really appreciate if you could just comment on the electoral bond judgment relative to the fact that judiciary is influenced by the prevalent Modi wave. Uh, so what do you think was that judgment an anomaly or what was there in that case that provided the uh, judges or the Supreme Court the space to make such a judgment that could have such a negative impact on Modi and his uh, campaign, election campaigns. So really Thank you. And uh, Sailesh, you have the third question. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So uh, I think contributing to, again, the hegemonic presence of former genuites, but maybe in a positive sense. Uh, not like <laughs> Next time we'll have a separate enclosure so, for you people. <laughs> <laughs> they come here in the summer, no? It's 46 degrees there. <laughs> One is uh, around uh, um, this um, 
Hinduism and Hindu uh, debate, and uh, might uh, this might be an unpopular opinion in my thinking. I was thinking Hinduism was more like during Congress era, secularism, Hinduism was more about upper castes coalition or networking across religions and ignoring lower caste across religions, whereas Hindutva has risen on the foundation of that, and it's like more like as they as in say as well, Jati Toro Hindu Joro. So mm. that's like consolidating Hindu and, and demonizing Muslims across caste then, mm. and even all other Abrahamic religions as well as uh Indic religions as well to a certain extent. Do you see that perhaps Congress's approach to making itself more diverse in terms of candidature, leadership positions uh, yeah. will impact or will help it gain more acceptance among uh, Indian masses, as we did see in 2024, going by the candidatures of both BJP and uh, Congress, because BJP, I could see that they gave more representation, again, to let's say so-called upper caste or among upper caste, Brahmins, Kayastas and all that else. Congress made itself more diverse. So that's one. And second around uh, diversity uh, versus executive interference within the judiciary. So we all have seen how Supreme Court led by the very considered progressive CJ Chandrachur hasn't been as progressive and has been complicit in rather you know, cost, changing the constitution in changing India. Um, so do you see again, uh, sorry, the question of diversity coming in there as well that maybe making judiciary also or higher judiciary also more diverse can impact or have a control over executive interference into judiciary uh, because again we do know the data that there has been only one judge so far from ST community there have been only 2.5 percent judges from SC communities and there have been 30 percent to 40 percent judges from Brahmin community you know, just male Brahmins which is hardly one to two percent population mm. so what do you think of these two uh, questions thank you thanks these are all great questions but next time please keep them slightly yes, short sorry, sorry. Yeah. yes okay mm. oh yeah, otherwise I'll forget the question. <laughs> okay, so as far as your question about the uh, centralizing tendencies of the Indian Constitution, obviously there are. I mean, the, in judgment after judgment, the court says that we are a federation, but with strong centralizing tendencies. That's the design of the Constitution. So uh, on the question whether that this is likely to change, uh, the, the, the states have been demanding that there should be a further devolution of power. And especially in the matter of financial uh, devolution of taxes. After the introduction of GST, the centralizing tendencies have increased because the states are no longer able to uh, raise indirect taxes. And all indirect taxes are going to the center, and the center is um, is not devolving these taxes onto the states. A, a pre-election campaign by the Karnataka government, the chief minister and deputy chief minister came to Delhi, and there were front page ads over there which said that our money must come back to us. So the states are definitely beginning to feel that they are contributing more to the center than the center is giving back to them. And that is obviously a very positive development because everybody in India now talks about, um, you know, there's almost like a internal migration taking place in the country. I know people who say, I'm not going to live in Delhi anymore. I'm going to live in Bengal. I'm not going to live here anymore. I'm going to live in Bangalore because the, everybody is looking for places where they can go and stay, where they feel relatively safe from the police. Now, the thing is that the other issue is that law and order is a state subject, which should be a which is a good thing but the center has enacted central laws the pmla is one of them the uapa is another one of them under which they have taken over the power to investigate all over the state so these if anything needs to change it is that which needs to change and uh, the, the the states are definitely making an effort to speak about decentralization on the electoral bonds, it is a bit of a mystery, and uh, we don't understand really how they came up with this judgment. We don't have access to the internal discussions which took place among the judges. 
What we do know is it's a unanimous judgment. But people have said that by the time they decided the case, the BJP already got the money they wanted. So they kept the uh, case pending a decision for about four to five years. So by that time, the money had already gone to them. And in this election, they used it. So, yes, in, in, uh, on paper, definitely it was a judgment that was much needed. But you see the attitude of the prime minister immediately after the judgment, he said, we will reenact this law. So that is the amount of scant respect that they have for the judiciary. And maybe that's one reason why the judiciary doesn't give progressive judgments, because they know they've done it now in the three criminal laws. The Supreme Court had decided there was no need for a preliminary inquiry. They've put it in the new law. So this is one issue. They can always override a judgment of the Supreme Court, and they've said it bluntly. On the electoral bonds, bonds the prime minister said it bluntly. And in fact, you know that it led to 600 lawyers signing a letter saying that we liberals are trying to influence the judiciary. And then there were another 600 letters saying we are not trying to influence the judiciary. And you are. So the judiciary has become a battleground in, in civil society also. On the Hindutva question, obviously, there can be no two views that diversity is needed. And um, it's not just caste, it's also gender, uh, where, which is heavily lacking uh, in the composition of the judiciary. So, I mean, everywhere in this, the, this government uh, doesn't have a single Muslim minister in it, in this government, in this 2024 government. So, yeah, we say it's a big success, but it's a government without a single Muslim minister, not one. So... Uh, Caste, religion, yes, they do dominate the, they are the governing principles of Indian society. Uh, I have Anand and Surbi and uh, Zishan over there. Oh, I thought you had, okay, so that, uh, well, you know, if your hand goes above your shoulder, I take that as a question. That's a biological. <laughs> That's uh, Surbi and Zishan and uh, you, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Very quick 30 seconds. You also just the position between the constitution and the government, uh, but the fact that constitution has acts like AFSPA and UFPA, to what extent does it actually allow for these sort of, uh, for lack of better word, fascist regime to prosper? And second, can Congress or India Alliance win without um, some sort of an alliance with the big corporate capital of India? To with the big corporate, corporate capital. capital, okay. Can they do without them? Yeah. Can they win without an alliance Can with Bitcoin? Well, you know, one of the turning points in this election was when the prime minister said that uh, his cronies, uh, his cronies, uh, Reliance and Adani were giving money to the Congress. The tempo, so tempo. that answers your question. Can they win? They can't without, without those alliances. Okay, Zisha so, and then you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, mm. thank you so much for this wonderful talk. So, so to just to build on what uh, Professor Bajpayee said, I am much more concerned about this design question in the constitution. Many a times we talk about constitutionalism, and rightly now you said that there is no Muslim minister in the current government. So why don't we prefix the word constitutionalism with ethnic constitutionalism in case of India? Because. <laughs> Because similar patterns we have seen in case of Israel also, where an ethnic community is given an upper hand in, uh, in comparison to the other community. And when we see the debates and discussion about citizenship in case of constituent assembly, we see that partition and the violence of partition played a very significant role in the structuring of the constitution. Because we talk about illegal migrants, then we talk about refugees. Then there comes this enemy property. See, all these things have further marginalized the Muslim community in India. So how better it would be to say the Indian constitution, constitutionalism to be ethnic constitutionalism? Okay, and then do you have a question there? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so my question was that in the last uh, opposition that government, the last Congress-led government, uh, the Home Minister had actually, you know, tightened and made even stricter uh, laws like the UAPA 
And there were cases, the lesser, but still there were cases of abuse in that uh, past government as well. So do you think that now with Rahul Gandhi, do you think there's a change in the among the opposition leads? Like, is there an awareness now that these laws, like for whenever the next come into power, that they should be sort of like reined in to prevent the abuse now that they've seen what's happened in the last 10 years? I, I didn't understand the question. No, he's saying that even in the previous government, which was the one that introduced the UAPA, mm. Uh, and of course, the you know from 2014 it got further weaponized. But you know these were created and you know massively used by Chidambaram as the Home Minister, yeah. things like that. So what he's asking is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you know as in when the opposition comes in, what is to be done with these kinds of laws? I mean, to make them like retain them, but in some other format, or create narrower conditions in which they can be applicable, or struck off altogether, mm. sort of. Yeah, accurate. Yeah. Okay. 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 So if we've got two questions. One on the ethnic nature of the constitution. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, I, I I really don't understand what is to be gained by calling it ethnic constitutionalism, and I don't wish to get into uh, the uh, the um, the terminology. Okay, the concept is important, obviously. So yes, I have heard people say that. Um, as I said, I made the distinction between de facto and de jure, okay? So de facto India is a Hindu state, okay? That's all I can tell you. And uh, uh, some people have actually said that uh, India is to Hindus was is what Israel is to Jews. I've heard this said, okay? So whether you call it ethnic constitutionalism or what you call it is, is something I cannot answer and I don't wish to answer to the terminology that is used. That's why I said when people call it an undeclared emergency, I don't know what that means. Okay, some of these, some of these terms have no meaning. But yes, the fact is that we already are pretty well advanced into being a Hindu state. It's it's right. If you don't have a single Muslim minister, how can you call yourself a secular country? That's that's it. But yet, of course, the constitution itself on its face states that it's secular. Plus, it has provisions for non-discrimination based on religion, Okay, which have not been negotiated till today. Yes, tomorrow, if they come to power, they may remove Article 15 from the Constitution of India. I don't know what they will do. So there is this distinction. How to deal with it is a separate issue altogether. On the question of the laws, the obvious answer is yes, these laws were brought in by the uh, UPA government. There's no doubt about it. Mr. Chidambaram has been faulted time and again. Uh, uh, for having brought in these laws, yes, the the uh, the NDA government has uh, worsened them. But if you want to know what is to be done, obviously the changes brought about the the most important of all the changes is you cannot presume a person to be guilty. Um, and our laws do presume. The talk that Anand gave two days back was just about that, demonstrating how the laws which have been brought in actually presume that you are guilty until you go to court and prove that you're innocent. That, of course, will have to be reversed in all laws across the board. Mm. Thank you. And just to say, you know, Surabhi, if you remember, I mean, this time around the CPI ML campaign was entirely based on what they call the People's Electoral Bond. And they had a sort of giant killing victory in ARA with the minister R.K. Singh defeated uh, by one of the comrades. Uh, the questions. Okay, I'll go with you first and then uh, over there. Thank you for the lecture, Ms. Johnson. Um, I'm just wondering about the future and it's a tricky question, but I'm thinking about the official and unofficial arms of the state and the first being the police. Do you envision a body of law um, sort of legal challenges where police brutality can be um, challenged effectively in the courts because the police are in, you know, they have the impunity and of course that's been legitimized by the state. And the second arm of the state I'm thinking about is the media. And I think this is a bit more murky because it's mixed with the corporates. Um, but how do we bring in uh, regulation of the media of like fake news, doctored videos um, in the courts 
Um, and I'm thinking about the potential of law to challenge these two separate bodies. And um, of course, enforcement is a different question. But I'm just wondering from like a legal um, point. Okay. And uh, there's you, and then there is Anand. Okay. Well, I'll come to you next. So, very informative talk, and uh, I totally understand how difficult it is to take up these challenges against the Indian government uh, uh, present. So, I want to reflect a bit on the kind of institutional support you have for undertaking the legal activism, activism that you do, mm -hmm. in terms of what kind of support broadly you get from civil society, from opposition political parties, etc. And going forward, after 2024, do you expect the space, space to improve a bit? I mean, these are two questions that I have about those practical aspects. Okay, Anand. Yes. I want to just contribute uh, the future. You know, in terms of caste and Hindutva, one of the debates that the BJP has engineered is what they call Sanatan Dharma, which is the core of Hindu values. Now, that is totally antithetical to the equality principle or notion in the Indian constitution. Not only that are they propagating, but they're also propagating the idea that the Aryans are actually indigenous people. And therefore, there's no issue of any difference on the basis of caste. So the future is going to be debates like that in order to subvert the constitution. Just to answer the friend at the back, you know, there are two ways of thinking it. You can't predict the future. But you're, and we have gone through it in the lawyers collective. Mm -hmm. If you want to bring out bring about change, you need to always think and work towards the vision of the constitution. You can either agree to do that and actually do it or give up. So there's no thing of asking people to support you. If you lead or if you take action, people will support you. I mean, whenever we go around, lots of students would tell you, please continue. You know, mm. and there is overwhelming support because of the work that is being done. And that's why the constitution is becoming popular. Thanks. So while you compose your answer, let me just be controversial on this matter. Uh, if you read Savarkar, Savarkar says that caste should be uh, directly attacked. And he organized many bhoj uh, for uh, so-called sahbhoj in which people from oppressed castes were encouraged, or well, people from upper caste, dominant caste, were encouraged to feed, you know, to eat with people who were at the bottom of, uh, who were oppressed. Secondly, and this also I think is an uncomfortable fact, which is that if you look at the number of Dalits and tribal SDSC people and their representation through the BJP in state legislatures, including also in ministries at state level, I think that they have a better record than any other political party. So there are these two truths, which come, and, and this is at the same time that, as other people have said, in, in relation to the maintenance of upper caste hegemony. And in my view, it is about accepting within a particular limit, uh, if as long as STSC people also agree to the terms set out by Hindutva, that is okay. But if they transgress it, then they, you know, basically face the brunt of uh, police brutality and all the rest of it. But to make an argument that they completely excluded, I think, would be uh, not facing it. And I think th the situation is slightly more complicated than, you know, a clear cut separation. But anyway, please. No, uh, on your question of fake news, it is obviously a double edged weapon. And... Uh, India has recently introduced um, uh, rules under the IT Act, Information Technology Act, uh, for complaints against fake news. Mm -hmm. But the irony is that they have set up an agency to decide whether the news is fake or not, and that agency is a government agency. So where do you go from there? Because much of the fake news is put out by the government itself. Hmm. So, you know, so it, it, it's, it's also a double-edged weapon because uh, you're saying this is not fake news, but they, it's, if it, if it in, in any sense critical of the government, they will call it fake news and they will take you to court. 
to to, uh, to you know to establish that you have committed an offense under the IT Act. So actually, the leaflet which you mentioned, we took the case to court in the Bombay High Court challenging those rules, and it still remains the only judgment uh, in the country by a high court where they actually stayed the implementation of part of those rules, uh, which would. Uh, which would give these extraordinary powers to government to 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 entertain complaints against what we write and to pull it down. Uh, then the Bombay High Court is recently entertaining a challenge to this particular law, which says the government will do the fact checking. There was a difference of opinion between two judges. It's gone to three judges. The matter is pending over there. So fake news is definitely an issue which is very difficult to deal with through the law because it can... It can cut both ways. The rest of the answers, I think Anand did provide one of the answers to yes. Uh, so when when I say the norm above the norm, it is they want Sanatan Dharma to be the norm. That's what they want. Uh, to to they wanted to replace the constitution. I mean, I initially I thought it was a joke all this talk about uh, decolonization, but it's not. It's not. It's based on this very fundamental notion that Indian civilization is better than any other civilization in the world. Whereas I, as I said, I take the view that 1947 represents a break with the past. So now the question is, how far in the past are you going to go? And the same issue arises, assuming there was oppression, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, by the Muslims, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They built you know, um, uh, mosques over temples. The question is, we did pass a law known as the Places of Worship Act, uh, which says that beyond 19, anything that was a place of worship in 1947 will remain a place of worship. worship. And in spite of that, they've been able to do what they've, but, but they're doing. So the question is, how far back in history are you going to go to make claims to legitimacy? And uh, they want to go back a thousand years to make claims to legitimacy, but you, you cannot do it if you if you have a constitution. Then you just have to abandon the constitution and say, we don't want this constitution anymore. And which is why I think it was very significant that uh, that people identified with the constitution to the degree. There was a definite consolidation of the Muslim vote. There was a definite consolidation of the SCST vote in this election. The outcome would not have been the way it was. And many people have remarked, including some of my own colleagues who are lawyers who worked on it, saying one thing that everybody's commented about is that despite all the provocations that the prime minister presented during the campaign, the Muslims hierarchy did not respond, did not react with violence. But what they did is they consolidated and they voted the way they voted. That's the, the results are in front of you. Yeah, it's a sort of a global anti-constitutional movement as well in country after country. Uh, I have you there, and then Nupur, you, and then you. Okay, please. Uh, so, hi, this, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of one of the fact checkers in India. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know one of my colleagues. Uh, it's a speculative question. So the question is like this. Um, if you're a television channel, your fate is controlled by the government, uh, right? So through licenses. Uh, and then if you're a newspaper, there's pressure on you indirectly uh, or directly through various media. So independent media has kind of left our own problem. But there are moves to regulate ind independent media as well. And there are moves to kind of, who knows, create a wall for India's internet even. So how do you see that playing forward? Uh, what would be the challenges and how would how would one mount up? Yeah, I definitely don't think they will give up. Sorry. Sorry, you would. I don't think they'll give up control over the airwaves. There's no question at all that the Indian government will give up control over the internet. In fact, the ultimate, uh, after all these laws have not worked, the, the one thing they do is shut down the internet. So uh, moving forward, I don't see any change on that front do you see any yeah. challenge oh the, oh, yeah. the, oh, the uh, legal challenges yes but political I don't know I'm not aware uh, this you and then oh, that um, is what are the personal costs for taking a stand against the establishment personal costs and then over there please so with 
Thinking about how when we're talking about India being now a de facto Hindu state and the complicity of the judiciary, particularly sort of the Indian judiciary leading secularism to be tolerant, rooted in an idea of Hindu religion. So does that mean today that we have lost Indian secularism, or is the idea of future of being able to uncouple Indian secularism with the Hindu values that are sort of to be retrospectively attached to it? Okay. Okay, so to that question, uh, see, somebody else raised the issue that there is, uh, there's always been a difference. I think you raised the issue that there's always been the difference between the way India looks at secularism and uh, certain other countries in the world. France, for instance, looks at secularism and uh, Indian secularism follows what Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi said, that all religions are equal. Now, there is a problem there, okay? Because um, it, it it means that as as constitutional policy, as national policy, you are allowing religion to flourish, all religions to flourish. But when you are a nation dominated by a Hindu majority, it is going to be the Hindu religion which is going to flourish. And so some people have argued that there is something really wrong with the concept of Indian secularism, and that's that's the heart of the problem. And secularism should mean a complete separation between state and <coughs> state and religion, which doesn't exist in India. So I think that that is the answer. So I, I don't think we have lost secularism uh, as yet. But uh, there is an attempt, yes, to if this if this election had not turned out the way it did, I would have said, yes, we've lost it. OK, but it did not turn out the way uh, this government wanted it. Uh, so, no, we haven't yet lost Indian secularism. And what was the other the question? Personal, uh, oh, the personal cost. <laughs> personal cost is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. We went through, we have an FR which is against us still today uh, for having misused foreign funding. Okay. It's a long story, which I can't give you in a moment, but uh, the, the, the reason for the uh, uh, police complaint against us is because we took cases to court against the prime minister, against the home minister, and against some of the leading members of the police force. So it is, it is a very heavy cost. Uh, uh, I mean, Mr. Grover and I, both of us have suffered immensely as a consequence of this FIR, but it took a while for for us to get over it. And uh, what helped was uh, to continue working as professional lawyers. That was one advantage that because we are self-employed, uh, the damage could be controlled. It was not as severe as it could have been if you are in employment and you lose, you are going to lose your job, obviously. You uh, you must know what happened to NewsClick. 200 journalists lost their devices. Uh, the accounts have been frozen. Their residences have been frozen. And uh, after six months of being in jail, probably you got bail. Okay, fine. And uh, do you want to go on? No, I think so. Uh, okay, last round of questions. Right. Just one question. That's okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, and, so, uh, what is your view on the two democratic elected chief ministers in jail? Do you think it's good, there's going to be a solution about it or it's going to continue like that? Whether they will get bail is, the, is your question. Well, uh, the trend that we are noticing is that they, the, the courts tend to say, all right, you spend some time in jail and after that you'll get released. Look, there's no question of their being in jail forever and ever. It's not going to happen that way. But they will be in jail for a substantial amount of time before they get... Should India Alliance push for their quick release and fast release? I, I haven't heard any demand as yet. I, have, I haven't heard any demand. 26, 26 June, we'll have a better idea. Parliament is meeting. Some people say there'll be a no confidence motion. Some people say that uh, India Alliance is going to walk out of the house. 
I don't know what is going to happen, but 26th June will be a very critical day for but India. It's, it's the first time ever that uh, parliament will meet and a PM has been appointed without there being a member of the parliamentary party of the BJP. So can't, that, hear, can't hear you. Without oh. there being a member. Without there being, a, I mean, the, the BJP's parliamentary party has not met. Yeah. So the BJP's parliamentary party has not elected him as the yes. prime minister. That's the but first yes, time ever. This is the first time. <laughs> yeah, it's a government of many firsts, as Anand is saying. Uh, yes, the last question, please. <laughs> thank, thank you for the really illuminating talk. My question uh, is regarding um, a trend that's happening in this country, uh, so not, not particularly about India. Um, in, in the last year, we've seen that laws such as um, the Public Order Act, which introduced new offenses like tunneling, locking on, etc., in response to a mass wave of uh, civil resistance in this country, whether it be about the climate, about um, uh, Palestine action, about the genocide in Gaza. So in some ways, uh, when you read something like a, a decent report um, by Lord Woodcock, uh, where he places recommendations about proscribing certain groups and limitations that should be placed and broadening the scope of programs like Prevent, in some ways, it feels it feels like uh, countries um, like this are, are taking inspiration from what, what has been done to uh, the, the law in India. So, so could you speak to that interaction a little bit and and how um, um, when you question certain people in India, like they, they can say, well, you you can look at what's happening in in the US and you can see what what's happening in the UK. Yeah. This is how democracies work. What would you say to that? Yeah. So the, I mean, in India, we'll say the reverse that we are taking inspiration from you, and you know, we we do say Modi is taking inspiration from Putin and from Trump. So yes, it's, it's, it does seem to be a universal trend. Yes, but the, in India, basically, it's unlawful activities act which is used all the time for anything at all. As I wrote recently, that if there's a riot, you call it a terrorist act. That's basically it. You escalate the law, but it's like using a hammer to kill a fly. Has the constitutionality of that act been challenged, or what? Not, no, not in any, um, not in any acceptable manner. There, there have been challenges, and the petitions are just pending with nobody pushing them. It's what's happened in the judiciary is that petitioners have had a chilling effect on petitioners. They don't, they don't want to push their petitions because they think the court will decide against them. But also the discretion of the Chief Justice to decide whether... It is. When, when the, when the it is that... that yeah, it is. Well, if the Chief Justice of India is in this country half the time, you should <laughs> ask him. You should ask him. Really, you should. He's come here. He's come to Oxford to tell the world that the new criminal laws in India are fine. On the day of the election. Yes, on the day he he arrived in this country on the third of June. On the on the third, you told me that. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> He was supposed to come here, but his schedule, we had scheduling problems. So, uh, also we were told. So, uh, anyway, uh, you know, thank you so much, Indira, for coming and for a wonderful talk. Um, <laughs>Thank you for asking wonderful questions to take the conversation further and for you uh, to you once again uh, for answering each of them patiently and in depth. Uh, so let's have a, you know. <laughs>